Our next panel is sponsored by SSB Hospitality. Please welcome to the stage our moderator, Rachel Palumbo. Good afternoon. Would you like some water? So we are moving from a very uh, Please, exciting, more financial discussion to something a little bit more relaxed. And we're going to be talking about the power of wellness and mindfulness in luxury hospitality. Um, so in the current era of luxury hospitality, wellness and mindfulness have emerged as game-changing factors. Luxury hotels are adopting these aspects as part of the services offerings to differentiate themselves and provide distinct experiences to their guests. And today, we are joined by a panel of experts in this area. I'm going to introduce each one of them to you, starting with Bruce Rohr at the end. Um, Bruce is the Vice President and Global Brand Leader at Marriott International. And I found something very interesting about Bruce online. Uh, Didn't realize he's been with Marriott, which is very amazing to me, over 26 years. That's right. He has suffered through multiple mergers and acquisitions, <laughs> and here he is today looking very calm and rested. So welcome, <laughs> Bruce. We're very happy to have you. And I also understand from what you shared with ILHA um, that you have some interesting stories to share about the, uh, the founder of your company and his uh, attachment to uh, prioritizing self-care and mindfulness in the industry, which is very interesting. I look forward to hearing more about that in our discussion. Great. So welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Keenan Simmons. Um, and Keenan is the Senior Vice President of Americas with Small Luxury Hotels of the World. And I've had the opportunity to work with Keenan in the past. We have several hotels with Nobu that are members of SLH, which is a wonderful company. And SLH really uh, focuses on smaller, more boutique-style hotels in the 50-room area. And they have hotels anywhere from, I think I read, rustic fishermen huts all the way to tree houses <laughs> to luxury boutiques in the city. So welcome, Keenan. We look Thank forward you. to your insights. Um, next, we have Alexandra Walterspiel, who is the president and COO of Sensei. Uh, which I have another connection with, uh, as they have a wonderful Nobu restaurant at their Lanai property in Hawaii, as well as, uh, not another Nobu, but uh, yeah, we do, actually in Porcupine, mm -hmm. uh, in Rancho Mirage. So welcome, Alexandra. I look Thank forward you. to hearing more about what you have to say. And right next to me, we have uh, a bona fide sleep expert, <laughs> um, J.D. Valia, Benil, uh, going to say got it. vanilla, see, I yeah. told you. Um, and JD is a hospitality sleep and wellness strategist uh, at designing sleep. And I thought this was a very interesting um, job that you have. And when I was reading about you and, and what you do, um, he's really all about, you know, getting people to that, that optimum sleep that everyone craves. And you are, you are going to share your sleep uh, expertise with us, and you are also known as a sleep nerd. I am. So I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> okay, great. So let's go ahead and start. Um, so we have the first question um, that I want to put out to the panel. Um, in the realm of personal health and self-care, wellness and well-being are often used interchangeably. Um, as we explore these concepts, I would like to start by asking the panelists what is the difference between wellness and well-being? And I'd like to go ahead and start with Alexandra. I would be happy to talk about that. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, really in our, in our industry, the term wellness is sort of the, the new boutique uh, word, term, that we all were introduced to, gosh, over 20 years ago at this point in time, that at, at one point was very bespoke, and then sort of everyone got into it. and started doing boutique without really knowing exactly what that meant. And um, there, there is actually a definition around wellness. So wellness specifically uh, describes the objective state of your health as measured by biomarkers, whether that's you know, blood pressure or uh, your cholesterol levels, your overall health, whether you have a disease or not. Well-being, 
which is really what most of us are focused on these days in, this, in our industry, is about the, um, the subjective nature of how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about our health and mental well-being. Um, and it's sort of measured by how hopeful, joyful, and energized we, we feel. And what is very interesting is that you know, while, while wellness is certainly a, a big comport, a component of well-being, um, it's really not the only thing. And you can have people that experience tremendous well-being that might not be actually well with their health. Um, vice versa, you can have people that are very healthy that are actually not experiencing a lot of well-being. So it's an inter interesting phenomenon. That's great. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? I mean, I tend to think that well-being kind of fosters wellness in a way, right? So to piggyback yeah. off of what Alex said, just, you know, this idea of, I think even coming out of the pandemic, um, I look at it that when I talk to our owners, our guests, our, even our associates, I always ask this question, you know, have your personal priorities shifted from before the pandemic to after the pandemic? And without a doubt, everyone in the in the conversation raises their hand, yes. And I think a lot of that is really focused on this idea of well-being and really how we're feeling about ourselves, but also how we are honoring what has changed about our lives and staying true to that as well. Very good. And I think even it goes beyond just the guest experience. I think, you know, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later, but also the, the employees, you know, about their wellness, about their well-being, we all know how hard it is to attract talent in the hotel business or hospitality in general. So there needs to be this focus on, on employee wellness and well-being as well. It's not just consumer facing. I, I agree and would add on to that that really, you know, ever since we've come out of the pandemic, um, behavior has shifted, not just our travelers' behavior, but also our employees' behavior. That's right. And what has become important is really a, a journey towards well-being, which is an individual approach for every single one of us. Well-being for those two gentlemen might be very different than for the two of you. Um, but there is no question that it, it, is, it is here to stay. It's not just a, a fad. It's not just a quick thing. I think well-being will be with the, the topic of well-being is going to be with us for hopefully ever. Very good. Yeah, you know, I actually struggled uh, trying to think about this question because I've always felt that wellness is kind of a, well, it's a buzzword and it's kind of cold in itself. Like well-being is much more intimate um, and it's much more about, you know, you as a person. Um, and I feel like when it comes to wellness, it's really just, you know, deploying a set of tools to actually improve your health. When it comes to well-being, though, I think that's the spot that we should really be focusing on because that's all about what we can teach you and what you can take on the road with you and how you can actually keep improving your well-being over time. And we have an opportunity to do that with our properties. Very good. Well, the next topic actually goes back to what some of you mentioned, the role of staff in delivering wellness and mindfulness. Um, let's discuss the importance of training staff to understand and deliver wellness and mindfulness services to guests. Uh, and Bruce, let's start with you. Sure. So, you know, JW Marriott, we probably aren't really top of mind when people think about brands that are, you know, around well-being, but it's actually been a, a, a core part of our heritage. And many people know that the founder of the company is named J. W. Marriott, and so that is our namesake, and our brand is really inspired by his approach to life. But our mission is really to create this haven where we take care of all the details so that our guests can really focus on themselves, you know, fully, their mind, body, and spirit. And when I talked to associates, when I came onto the, the JW brand a few years ago, you know, the associates came to me and said, Bruce, you know, yeah, that kind of makes sense, but it's a little pie in the sky. Like, I'm not into meditation, and I'm not into yoga or some of these other practices. And, you know, what I discovered was we really needed to create this really authentic connection to our brand and to our founder. And so through some of the conversation uh, that you were mentioning about the founder and his approach to life, you know, back in his day, it wasn't known as mindfulness, but there were a lot of well-being practices that Jay Willard Marriott did as he was creating this, this hospitality enterprise that we know today now as Marriott International. He loved to be outside in nature and take long, wa long walks. He journaled every night before going to bed for moments of gratitude. 
he loved to sing. We actually have old um, family videos of him singing and you know, the joy that that brought to his life and of course his time with family. So as soon as I started talking about these really tangible examples of how he lived his life, our associates then were able to connect that much more concretely to, oh, it doesn't have to be just this one prescription of what well-being is to others. It's really a personal, what does well-being mean to me? So connecting the positioning through really tangible examples to our associates has been key. And then the associates now connect further to that, some of them at our hotels have created Zen dens in the back of the house or other mindful spaces where they're just able to have moments to be present, rejuvenate during a break, and really then ultimately be able to understand these same kinds of practices are what our guests are also craving as well. So then taking it a step further, how do they connect to the guest? How do they find out about you know, their personal preferences when it comes to well-being, and how do we facilitate that? But ultimately, for us at JW, we really had to create that foundation first of what does well-being mean to each of us, and how do they connect that back to the positioning of the brand? Thank you, Bruce. And uh, Alexandra, uh, in your retreats, how do your guides uh, work with that, or, or at least Yes, we, um, uh, so I, I agree with everything that you just said, and I, I, before I answer that directly, I also want to say that you know, we, we heard on, on many panels today a very consistent message that luxury travel specifically is about creating amazing experience, making it extremely personal, customizing it, and that at the end of the day, it is the staff, the team members, the associates, the colleagues, whatever we, we call them, depending on the brand that we work for, that brings us to life. And while there is certainly automation possible, um, we believe that the automation and the technology should be supporting us in the background. The wellness delivery and experience delivery really will continue to be done by very caring individuals. And if we don't care for them ourselves, then it's going to be difficult for them to care for our guests. At Sensei, we have, a, um, we have really a, a key role that we call the Sensei Guides. Um, they are uh, highly educated practitioners in the field of exercise physiology, mindset, and nutrition. Um, we believe that well-being really is anchored in what we call the, the sensei way, which is uh, the three paths of move, nourish, and rest. It's not rocket science. <laughs> um, most, most wellness companies have a, a similar approach. But movement is really how we engage with the world. Nourish is how we nurture not just our body and our soul, and rest is how we recharge. And our guides determine together with you, our guest, where you are in your wellness journey. You, you might be a wellness agnostic today that doesn't even know yet what that means, or you might be a, a wellness enthusiast that has a very clear understanding already as to kind of what your, your, uh, your path is. And we meet our guests really where they are at and then make recommendations that are anchored in those three paths of move, nourish, and rest. Wonderful, that's great. Yeah, and I, if I could build on uh, both of those comments, which I think are great, um, you know, I, I feel like too, there's this opportunity to go beyond even calling it training. Like we should really be building a culture around that's right. this. Mm -hmm. um, so prior to starting Designing Sleep, I worked at Serta Simmons Bedding, our lovely sponsors for this. Um, and one of the things that I did was I, I was tasked with creating a culture that values sleep, right? So basic things that we could do to do that. So first, first off was new hire orientation. Every, every new hire in the company met with me for an hour and got a how to hack your sleep session. That I had office hours dedicated to sleep so you could schedule time and talk to me about sleep. Um, and the premise for that was really that it's not about mattresses, it's about sleep, because that's the end of the day. At the end of the day, that's what we really sold, was better sleep. Uh, and the only way to really do that is to get everybody on board, make sure everybody is sleeping well before you can actually progress on. Like, how can you help your customers if you're not even helping your own people? And the beauty of that is then it led to, you know, we, have these, we had these amazing uh, employee purchase pro programs, so now you can sleep on the mattresses and you can make better recommendations. And I find that at the end of the day, a solid recommendation is the key to, to unlocking a ton of potential. So it's no different than when you're at a restaurant and you want a, you want a recommendation on uh, you know, chicken versus steak. 
You know, and yeah, someone could say, oh, get the steak because that's what everybody gets, but that's not the recommendation that you really want. You want someone to tell you, no, get the steak, but get it this way, because mm -hmm. that's how I do it. And that's way more powerful. It makes you feel um, more special and unique about it. And it makes you feel like you're getting something that maybe no one else is getting. Mm -hmm. Very personalized service, absolutely. And Keenan, anything you can share from... No, I mean, I, I agree with everybody on the panel, but I think also hospitality in general is playing catch up. Mm. Um, you know, I think, you know, you look what the tech industry has done years ago with, with giving people more time, free time to, to, you know, experience things outside of work, whereas in hotels or hospitality or restaurants or what have you, there, there's never been this focus on the employee health and well-being. Mm. So, you know, COVID, I think, you know, sped things up, but we, we are still playing catch up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, instead of, you know, coffee breaks, now you're hearing about people giving sanity breaks because mm -hmm. being in front of the customer and how demanding customers are now, employees need that. Very true. The next subject I think we should talk about would be the amenities uh, and the different ways that hotels can incorporate these, uh, you know, such as spa treatments, yoga classes, um, meditation sessions, healthy dining, so services and amenities. Uh, and let's start with you, JD. Yeah, so um, for me, it's more of a mindset shift. Um, it's not so much amenities, it's the fact that we need, to get, we need to get into the mindset that we're problem solvers. And what we're trying to do is not only provide great service, but we're trying to reduce friction points through their journey when they're at the property. Um, and so, you know, a perfect example would be, uh, you know, the first night, winning the first night. So those of us that traveled in um, for this event, you know, our sleep is disrupted for the first night. Most of us just don't get sleep, you know, the quality sleep that we're used to, at least. You know, our routines are off, we might be jet lagged, there's so many other variables that are going on. And so like winning the first night is like one of the critical things that I think we should focus on. The second thing is, is like, when it comes to uh, amenities, you really need to understand who I am and who our guests are. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, you know, when we think about, you know, we talk about our, our loyalty apps and they have pillow menus and all of that stuff. And those are great options, but they don't really know me intimately enough. So for example, which JD is coming to your property? Is it businessman JD, family man JD, <laughs> my alter ego party animal JD? I'll tell you right now, party animal JD doesn't really care about the pillow because I may not even remember getting to bed, but what I do care about is electrolytes, what time I'm woken up, the food that I'm served in the morning. Um, so I think there's this opportunity to go a little bit further, get way more intimate with our customers, um, and do it in a way where we scale it slowly. Right, there's no need to like blow this out and you know, redefine everything that you're doing at a property. Find a handful of guests, a handful of, of employees that are really passionate about this, test it out, iterate on it, and then slowly start to scale the process. Very interesting. That's yeah. a whole other conversation I look forward to <laughs> yeah, having with you later exactly. on. I do, I do think in a, in a more traditional wellness retreat, obviously you do need amenities, um, but uh, a yoga pavilion, a fitness pavilion, an assessment studio, those kind of things. That being said, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a lot to create well-being. We, we, again, at Sensei believe that there has to be a connection to nature, there has to be a connection to art. It's interesting that you talked about nature and art music um, before. Um, and, you, you know, that, is, that, is, that surrounds us, that is nature just around us. Um, you can get into all kinds of cool fads and ideas and you know, new amenities. We as a company have chosen to not go that direction and we really only do things that are completely evidence-based that have been proven. So at Sensei, we do not add CBD into our massage oil because there is not enough evidence pro or con um, that really substantiates that there is a true benefit from it. Um, there are many other companies that are, that are very quickly moving into all kinds of very cool gadgets, mm -hmm. amenities, um, and some of them might be amazing. And at the end of the day, if, if well-being is how we feel about ourselves and that makes a guest feel good, then more power to them. Mm -hmm. Very good. And I think going back to what JD said earlier about you know knowing your guest and, and knowing your customer. Um, you know, before we were you know talking about this panel and looking at some of our hotels and. 
you know, they've even gone to the, the, the point of regionalizing it. So for example, one of our hotels in Copenhagen where it's dark, you know, 12, 14 hours a day in the winter, they introduce light therapy because mm -hmm. they know that their Scandinavian customers regionally, you know, are, are sun deprived during the winter. So mm -hmm. they started to institute things that were, were more geared towards, you know, majority of their guests coming through the door. Do you see any of these, any of your experiences with animals or anything like that, introducing that for, you know, for mental health, things like that? Have you introduced any of that or experienced that, any of the hotels that you have? I mean, I, th I think what Alexandra said, it's this getting back to nature. Yeah. Um, nature is, is somewhat of a new luxury for people. Mm -hmm. People want to get out and explore. They, 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 they want to be mindful of their surroundings and they want space. We've, we've done retreats um, for equine therapy um, mm. and, and there's no question that that's incredibly powerful. Um, and then back to nature, you know, we we're developing a, a hiking retreat that is really all about obviously the physical exercise but also the just landscape beauty that surrounds you and the appreciation of that. It's amazing what it does to your heart rate when you look at something beautiful. Definitely. Wonderful. So on to the next topic, which isn't so uh, natural, uh, but maybe the monetization of <laughs> mindfulness and wellness. Um, so let's discuss the potential return on investment from implementing wellness and mindfulness programs, including increased guest loyalty and revenue optimization. And Keenan, would you like to start? I mean, I, I think there's always a business case there. You know, you, you heard earlier in the panel about, you know, trillion dollar um, spending in the wellness, it's actually from a stat that I saw recently, it's about $4.4 trillion. I mean, that's, that's a huge number, um, you know, that, that's out there. Um, we recently are, are in the process of launching a wellness collection. So we have 520 unique properties around the globe, and it's really to give the guests the, the content to pick and choose their sort of wellness experience based upon you know, their, their, their comfort level, so to say. Um, you know, if you look at, at groups like Virtuoso, um, they recently did a trend survey that said 21% of people traveling in the luxury segment are traveling for wellness or, or for health reasons. I mean, that's a big, big number. So um, I, I think there is a business case for it, but you have to do it right. Mm -hmm. You have to do it, you know, authentic and, and you know, give people what, what they're looking for. And I think going back to Alexandra's point earlier, it can't just be a trend. You no. can't follow the trends. You need to stay true to your, to your core business as well. I think also just to continue that thought is that if you just look at the younger generation though that's coming up and becoming the predominant guest at all of our brands, this is table stakes. This is an expectation. This is the concept of uh, traveling well versus well-traveled is really a thing for, for that generation. And I was just in China recently, and it skews even younger in, in China. And so, um, you know, there is a business case to be tapped into this, and we're looking at it from every aspect of the guest journey. How do we incorporate this into even our meetings and events? Because we know, for us, that's a main reason why people are staying with us at JW. We're not trying to be sensei. We're not trying to be six senses. We're trying to stay true to the guests that we know who already trust us. But how do we lean in further here? And I think to have that point of view is important. And we also track through our guest satisfaction surveys this idea of did we enable a mindful stay for you? And there are some direct connections between how we perform in that question to some of the questions around personalized service and anticipation of needs. So we're able to also use this as a way to monitor our progress in, in increasing those scores too, which we know gives a reason then to increase rates and, and hopefully drive more revenue opportunity for our owners. Yeah. And it can be a differentiator. You know? Absolutely. We're, we're, we're in a space where we work primarily with independent owners who have a real um, connection to their destination or their region. So a lot of those hotels are bringing unique experience, you know, f just from the region and from mm -hmm. people in the community. Um, you know, for example, we have a hotel in Bhutan where they have in-house um, traditional spiritual 
medicine and doctors that meet with each guest to come up with a, a specialized program, not only while they're on property, but giving them the tools to you know, take that home with them as well. And I would add to that that you know, wellness is really not a transaction, it's a, it's a journey. And mm -hmm. with that, you know, we, we develop a relationship with our guests from their first stay that goes well beyond their actual stay on property. As a matter of fact, we're now developing a new uh, program to support them even between hotel stays. Mm. But it's remarkable at this point in time, we only have two properties, but the repeat guest factor and the, the travel between those two properties is significant. And one of the things where we have technology, again, support the people that are, that are involved is when, when you embark on your wellness journey with us and we take certain measurements, you set certain goals for yourself, we're able to keep track of those with you and then when you either come back to the property that you were at or you go to our other one, we, we pick up from, from where you left and we build up from there. And so, you know, Porcupine Creek um, and Rancho Mirage has only been open for a year, but we have truly, it, it, repeat guest percentage is enormous for one, for one year. And some guests that are back for their fifth, sixth, seventh stay because they just they just keep on going with that. And Keenan, to to what you said, the 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 money in the global wellness travel business is is huge, which I think is also why everyone is jumping onto this bandwagon. The Global Wellness Institute started kind of measuring spend on this, and those numbers are truly astounding. And of course, you know, everyone would like to be uh, part of that and, and take a slice of that, but to what you said, again, it, it needs to be authentic, there needs to be a real story behind it. And yeah. it's not just a nice to have anymore. I mean, just because you yeah. have a spa or a fitness center, it's, no it's kind of the norm at, at every level now. Mm -hmm. um, right. It it's, goes far beyond that. It and does. sometimes too, you know, it's, it's, if, you're, if you're developing a new service or product, sometimes it's very difficult to actually build a proper business case because mm -hmm. really at the end of the day it's all assumptions anyway and you have to it's it's you know you can't just come out with KPIs or even use and this is a, a word that makes me cringe <laughs> the processes that we already have in place right because if you're developing something that's first of its kind there is no process that's going to work for that it's a process that you have to build with your team right there on the spot and same thing with your assumptions and your KPIs like sometimes um, there's just no direct correlation straight to, you know, revenue. Um, you know, if you're looking at sleep, for example, there's a lot of case studies coming out now around the impact of a quality night of sleep based on um, the guest perception of the property. Uh, mm -hmm. We also know that if, you're, if your guest sleeps well, they're in a better mood, they're more mm -hmm. likely to appreciate the property, use the amenities, it's a different mindset. But I don't know that I could necessarily wrap a direct correlation to dollars around that, maybe to loyalty, customer satisfaction. So I think there, mm -hmm. there has to be a willingness to go beyond the processes that you already use and the KPIs that are already in place and try something different. Definitely. Well, that leads us to the next, uh, next discussion, which would be great to get some case studies from each of you um, that you could share. And you can start with uh, Alex, you wanna start in the middle? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, case studies sound so clinical again. It's like we, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily have data. I'll, I'll, I can give you some more anecdotal case studies that if you want. Yeah. Um, you know, your wellness journey really is only as good as um, how open you are to essentially surrendering and, and allowing mm -hmm. um, yourself to open up. And I, uh, when I was thinking about the topic, I, I thought, you know, how shall I best describe this? And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. One, a couple, couple of examples. One where it was a very positive life transforming case study and another one where it didn't go so well. Um, but at Sensil and I, we had a, a, a very, very successful businesswoman that came and stayed with us. And she was determined that she was going to experience wellness while with us. <laughs> um, and guess what? It, it didn't happen. Um, and I, I, I actually got to meet her. I happened to be on the island when she was there. And from the moment that she arrived, she became what we call an opportunity guest, a Kaizen guest, as we call them now. Um, and I, I sat down with her, and I chatted with her. And, and I, I said, you know, I, I can make some recommendations for you. But 
you, you will not really fully appreciate what we have to offer if you don't allow yourself to, to open up. And what I suggested to her was to do a, uh, a treatment called an aquatic body therapy. And for, for any one of you that has done it, it's also called Watsu, Water Shiatsu. It, it is an incredibly emotional experience um, because you fully entrust your practitioner to move you through the water and sometimes underwater. And what occurs to you is, is, is it's hard to really express it because it, it just opens up an emotional valve that is, again, unique to every single individual that experience it, experiences it, but very few people come out of that water untouched. And I was so hoping that she would allow us to do that for her, with her, because I think it would have opened up a whole new path. Mm. Mm. And she was terrified. And she decided not to do it. And I think in the five days that she was with us, she got one massage treatment that she said she didn't particularly enjoy. <laughs> and I was like, I, I, can't, I, can't help, I can't help someone with that. But then um, the, the other example, and this happens quite often too, that we have couples that come together where one member of the couple is the driving force behind coming to a, a wellness retreat, and the other one is the reluctant, <laughs> accomplice. okay, fine, I'll join you if I have to, but I really have no idea what I'm doing here, and I really don't want to experience anything. And that's where um, our, one of our guides came into the picture and actually just started, I, I figured me, gentlemen, it happened to be the husband in this case that was really not into the, uh, into the wellness journey, wellness idea, but uh, one of our guides just struck up a conversation with him in the lobby and embarked onto this, this one hour long conversation about all kinds of things in life. It started with sports, again, sorry, no, it just happened to be the, the case. And I will tell you, at the end of their stay, he was transformed. And this couple has now come back. I think they're, they're coming for their fourth visit wow. at Sense Lanai and have completely embarked, not only on a, on a wellness journey individually, but also together as a couple that is really now able to appreciate this together. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's really good to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Bruce, do you want to share anything? On I so want to go stay at your hotel. I know. <laughs> you can. Sensei.com. I, 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 I know. <laughs> uh, well, I'll take a slightly different uh, take on this because as a brand that's not, you know, going in the direction that Sensei is. But, you know, for us, it's really important to affiliate ourselves with partners who can, you know, create this win-win in terms of credibility in the space for us, but also partners that we can learn from, right, to be able to grow in this space. And so one example of that is uh, we are unveiling a, a new program where every one of our hotels will have a garden that they incorporate, whether it's into food and beverage or to spa or uh, all elements of the guest journey. But we partnered with a, a woman named Lily Kwong, who you, many of you may know. Uh, she's a, a well-known landscape uh, architect, but she's also a media darling, and she's just fantastic. And she really lives this essence of, you know, environmental well-being, to be honest. And, and so we partnered with her to create these exceptional gardens at three of our locations, actually four of our locations. And just being able to use her platform to kind of help tell our story and vice versa for her to be able to connect with so many of our loyalists around the globe, that was a really beneficial case study for us in terms of how we can, you know, again, continue to look for other partners out there where we can have a mutually beneficial relationship. And so we have more partnerships to unveil this next year, uh, but that, that's a little bit of what we're doing in the space in terms of a case study I could share. Very nice. And gardens. Um, and Keenan? I don't know if it's so much of a case study, but I think if you look at the, you know, the proliferation of, of different brands that are coming into this space, you know, that are focused, you know, like you have brands like Equinox, who, who started out, you know, in the health and fitness business. Mm -hmm. Now they're going into hotels. Um, it just shows you that how important wellness is for everybody. You know, when people are traveling, whether it's for business or pleasure, they want to continue, you know, their wellness regimen or, or mindfulness regimen when they're traveling. So it's, it's only going to get bigger. Mm -hmm. and, and not just about facilities even, it's about cuisine, it's about, 
you know, gluten-free, vegan. I mean, there's just so much more components to all of this that it's just going to keep getting bigger and, and they're bigger. they're looking for yeah. continuity. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'd say my favorite use case, it's a little bit older, uh, from 1999, but uh, the West End Heavenly Bed. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, one yeah. of my favorite ones. <laughs> one of the ones that, you know, I still I hear about them. West End Heavenly Beds all the time. <laughs> Um, and it's really fascinating what they did now. You know, I think they put, they put a lot of money into it. They did, it was like $30 million into this program. I think they outfitted 30 to 40,000 hotel rooms with all new bedding systems. Yes. Um, but what they did was really fascinating and it was something that I haven't seen done uh, definitely anywhere near that scale. So one, they treated the, the, the mattress area, they treated it as a sleep system. So it wasn't just a mattress with all these various top of bed items. It was all carefully and intentionally constructed so that each component works to amplify the other one. Um, so they created a sleep system, which a lot of the times we don't think about it that way. It's like, oh, I buy the mattress from here, I buy the sheets from here, but they have to work together. There's a whole science behind all of this. Um, and what's, what's interesting is like the mattress that they chose, it was like a pillow top which I wouldn't recommend, but we could talk about that another time. <laughs> they chose high thread count linen, which is what, something else I wouldn't recommend because it messes with your airflow and you know, being comfortable. Um, but the beauty of it was they created a branded sleep experience. It was revolutionary. Something that you yeah. could purchase and put it in your home after staying there. And that's something that we don't really think about. Like even as us traveling right now, so we have you know, maybe all these comforts at home, but when you go travel, it's a totally different set of products that you're using. So to be able to have that sleep system at your house, sleep on it, love it, know it. Of course, when you go to a Westin, you have a much more predictable sleep experience mm -hmm. there because you're using those products already. Um, and so yeah, branding that idea, um, branding the sleep experience, which again, I haven't seen done um, anywhere near that scale, um, and then just that connection to your brand, like they don't even realize that the heavenly bed was made by Serta Simmons Bedding. Mm -hmm. They just think it's made by Weston, period. And they always attribute your it to the Your label's under the... Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> hidden yeah. in the fine print. <laughs> wow, that's very true. That definitely turned our industry upside down for sure. Big yeah. focus on that. As we're getting close to the end, I did want to have each of you just comment on the future of wellness and mindfulness and maybe just give a short statement on what you feel is the future. Um, and Keenan kind of made a point that this is evolving and, and going on and on, but it'd be good to hear from all of you what your thoughts are. I mean, I think it's going to get more personalized. Mm. I think everybody has a different uh, expectation or, or even requirements. So I think, you know, hyper-personalization, like we, we talk about in, in the business, you know, ad nauseum right now, I think in the wellness space, it's going to be even more important. And then also bringing technology into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a new hotel brand um, that's being launched around fitness and, um, and, and better physical health. And this particular property, they're saying they're going to take a 3D scan of your body before you even get to the hotel to wow. put a plan together to help you get in, in better physical shape. Wow. wow. Yeah, I think. Uh, you know, that's actually a perfect build to what I was thinking, right? So we're, we're you know, the buzzwords nowadays are AI and we're talking about AI and, and you know, the metaverse and all these things. So I do, I do envision a time where, you know, are, is your, your meditation session and your wellness session, do you even need to leave the hotel room for that? Like, are you just in your room and you can just, boom, you can go off into a different reality from the comfort of, your, of the guest room? Um, what I will say though is, you know, a lot of the times like we rush into these technology things um, and even with AI, like we should, be, we should be experimenting with all of these things at a very small scale so that we're comfortable with the tools and we understand them. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you need to scale right away. So like cautiously optimistic, but we should all be playing with AI. We should all be experimenting with, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality because there is potential there. It's just, you know, there's, it's a demographic thing as well, right? So even with AI, you know, I'm never going to listen to an AI bot tell me anything about sleep. But I'll listen to you. I'll listen to a human who actually has a solid recommendation mm -hmm. that I can relate to. Um, but there's going to be a group like you know our kids. They're just going to listen to AI, and mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have to start thinking about it now, and we have to start experimenting with these tools now. Definitely. Anything else? Yeah, I think, uh, as we said earlier, wellness is here to stay. It's just going to expand. I think it's going to go into different extreme directions. There's going to be a group that is going to be really anchored in 
traditional wellness actually going back centuries, millennia, then there's going to be a group that is going to catch on to technology and fads and quick fixes. Um, and by the way, anti-aging does not exist. I'm very sorry to tell you that. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, it's, it's about finding the, the balance in that and what it means. I do think that, um, going back to what Bruce said in the very beginning, I think that wellness in the workplace is going to be, become a much bigger topic. Companies investing uh, in the well-being of their employees by sending them on retreats, by uh, finding ways to really support them in their wellness journey. And then I also, you know, feel for us that there's a huge opportunity in... Uh, uh, in wellness living, so, you know, we call it sensei living for the future, but wellness communities where, mm -hmm. where it is about living that life naturally, so it's not just something that you do on vacation or in a, in a hotel environment, but where really residential communities are built that way, um, where residences that are part of a hotel environment are part of the wellness experience, and that actually is exciting also for sleep because then those resonances can really be built out. We had a conversation where, you know, for, for us, we really try and make sure that we educate our guests with and, and make recommendations that they can take home with them where they might not have a sleep lab perfect bedroom environment. <laughs> um, but when we get into residences and building according to those specs, we can actually build that bedroom perfectly so that the sleep experience is amazing. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, maybe we should just open it up to some questions as we're coming sure. down to the last few minutes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> you, go ahead. Hi, I'm approaching this from the design side. How can we as interior designers help support this well-being and wellness journey in these properties? What do we need to do to educate ourselves to, to support yep. your journey Great, great question. And if I may, I'll, I'll take that um, first. Um, so for us, interior design, actually hospitality and interior design is not on the main stage. We are the supporting actors in this. So when you come to our properties, you will see that we use very muted colors um, and we have a wide range of grayish in our interior design. But the only reason for that is to not take away from the beauty of nature that surrounds us, from the beauty of art that we have hung. We don't ever want the interior design to be the in-your-face experience. Now, that is sensei-specific. I don't know, you know how else. Obviously, then, going back to the, the last topic, I think the more interior design can then support truly the wellness experience by materials used, natural materials, soundproofing, blackout shades, all, all of those things um, that only support the wellness experience further is the way I think that your trade can help. Yeah, I think your trade is actually at the center of it, right? Because, you know, especially when it comes to sleep, there's the mattress system, which is all about maximizing comfort. Everything else, the sleep environment is critical critical to how well you sleep. So there's a huge opportunity there. I think if you just, you know, just do a simple mind experiment, you know, imagine your bedroom right now, take everything out of it and only replace it with the items that help you sleep better. Your bedroom looks fundamentally different, but there are things you can add in there very, you know, intentionally um, to actually improve that experience. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Uh, I think you had a question too? Yeah. Oh, yes. can you, but everyone. The rest of the room yeah, might not be able so to. They can hear. Um, this is just going back a step when we were talking about using AI for hyper personalization, especially at the very high end. Um, what best practices, if any, can you talk about for personal privacy that arise? From for the personal privacy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Some best practices for personal? Well, personal privacy as okay. it relates to AI and hyper-personalization oh, of a guest <laughs> experience in a place Ooh. like, you know, I'm a big fan of Sensei. So I know Thank everything you. about, but this part, for instance, I don't know. I think it's a, a big space and everybody's trying yeah. to figure I don't want to dominate the stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. 
Okay. If you have a good answer, please. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, listen, it, the, we, we don't know yet what AI is or is not going to do to society and life yeah. on Earth as we know it. Um, and I think with everything, it's, it's moderation. And um, one of the things for us is that we, we, we have to start by creating an emotionally safe environment for our guests. We have a lot of very high profile guests that are used to being bombarded with requests for autographs and attention. And this goes back, and I think this is really not, not rocket science, this goes back to the tenet of just luxury hospitality, mm -hmm. is to allow them their space and their privacy to be who they are. How AI ultimately is gonna fit into that, I don't know exactly yet, but one of the things is funny that JD talked about this earlier, we are very keenly focused on, on, on making sure that we actually understand which JD is showing up to our property because without question, the business traveler is different from the family traveler and what did you say, the alter ego, the party animal that he actually is most of the time, he's just not admitting it to us. Um, that is where AI is going to be able to help. Um, that is really where technology and at the moment in the absence of AI or before AI, just keen observation and anticipation of needs was, was really part of it. So I'm not sure that that exactly answers your question, but. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I, we are out of time. Um, so I want to thank the panelists very much for all their uh, insights, which was very helpful. And thank you all. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.